Good morning, fellowship. Let's take a few seconds and let's just welcome our Huntington Drive campus. What's up, Huntington Drive? So glad to have you guys here. Y'all, listen, I've got a lot of fish to fry and not a lot of time to fry it. Um, it's a southern, southern phrase to say, I got a lot to say uh, and not a lot of time to say it. So I want to jump right in. Matthew chapter 9, no surprises there. Uh, as we continue in our series on Matthew chapter 9, we're going to stay in our anchor verse. Last week we were in the anchor verse um, and we're going to go back there. Matthew chapter 9, uh, let's look at verse 37 and 38. Verse 37 and 38, Matthew chapter 9. I've switched. Usually I'm in the NIV. Um, for the latter part of this series, I'm in the New King James Version, the New King James Version. So if you see a little discrepancy there in translation, uh, that, that's what's happened. The homeboy then got a new Bible, and I am loving it. It feels so good. Sounds like I'm doing New King James. What's up, Brother Jimmy? Um, so, <clears throat> and, and I love the articulation and the translation for, especially for our anchor verse. It sounds, sounds like it did when I was growing up as a child. Um, chapter 9, verse 37, 38, here we go. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers, everybody say laborers. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. There it is again. Everybody say laborers into his harvest. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Father, when we open this book, we open up power. May that power be unleashed in this room today. More importantly, may it be unleashed in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our actions. Speak, O oh Lord. Your children have gathered to listen. Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience all that you have for us. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, or do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. Amen, amen, amen. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to do uh, some missions work uh, in China. Uh, we were in some rural regions of China where we were literally uh, in people's homes sharing the gospel uh, underground. Um, the authorities, it was important that they not find out that we were there. Uh, but oddly enough, uh, our host was a police officer. Um, he had accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior uh, and it opened up his home and we would literally teach the Bible from 8 a.m. Uh, to 6 p.m. We would do breakfast, lunch, and dinner and it was an amazing time. Well, a part of our time there, uh, when we got ready to take a break, they took us out um, and uh, we could act like tourists uh, at that time, which was interesting because several people thought I was like LeBron James or something. It was a... <laughs> You can just tell it was the first black person that they had ever seen in their life. You know what I mean? One girl almost tried to touch me. I was like, hold on, let me help you understand black people real quick. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do touching of hair or face, FYI. You know what I mean? So it was just fascinating. And, you know, I just leaned into it. I was like, I'm an evangelist. Let me just be all things to all people. So I signed some autographs. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> yeah, I ain't going to lie. Um, so, so it was good. One, one, of the, one of the things that we got to do is we got a chance to go to see the Great Wall of China, uh, the Great Wall of China. As a matter of fact, we got a picture of it. Uh, if, if, you, if you've never been there, as you'll notice, this is, a, this, is a, this is a picture from above the Great Wall of China. Uh, so this is a drone or something that they've gotten in child 72T. Uh, that's you, lady. They didn't lost control in the kids' area. It's cold red in the kids' area. It's come get Junior. He's lost control. Huntington Drive, y'all pay attention now. Don't let the, let the sign catch you with your kids off. So anyway, but to get to, the, um, to get to the Great Wall of China, you start at the ground. 
And I remember looking up at it. So, so imagine looking up at it, and it is, it, is the, it is the wonder of the world. It is the wonder of the world. But you, but you pull up, and it's down in the village, and it's, it's like way up there. It's, it's not like, oh, let me walk over here. No, 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 it's way up there. As a matter of fact, you have to take a, um, a ski lift to get there. Uh, and I don't know if you know how a ski lift works. I, 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 I didn't because the brother ain't really been skiing. It's another, I've made enough cultural references. I don't need to go there again. But um, <clears throat> the, the ski lift, it, well, the way it works is it starts at the bottom and then it goes up to the top. Now, here's a problem with a brother. I, 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 don't, um, I don't do heights. Like, I'll do a plane because that's a lot of metal around you holding it up. So if I feel a sense of security, you know what I mean? But a ski lift, yo, in this ski lift, it wasn't a new one. You know what I mean? It looked like it was old. As a matter of fact, we got a picture of it. Look, look, watch this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at that. Now, now, if you notice, this looked like it was made in 1905. And it ain't a rail in the front to, hold, to lock you. You know how at the fair they lock you in and they come around and snap. Oh, what no snapping, no, no locking in. And the way it works is you just got to, it's just, it's on a conveyor belt. So it's just going. You don't have the fair they stop a ride. You get on, get secured in, everybody's safety checked, and then they launch it back. It ain't like that in China, in China on the thing. It's just going. Now, you get on or not, but it's keeping going. You know what I mean? You safe or not, it's keeping going. You see what I'm saying? So it's just rolling, right? So you got to kind of almost like double dutch. You kind of like, all right, I got to get up. And then you sit down and you ride. You know what I mean? You're riding up. So I'm already nervous and it's happening fast. And I'm on there with a group of friends, my friend Ricky from Southwest Church. We on there and we... And we get on, woo, so it's taking us up. And so my thing is, all right, I want to see the Great Wall of China. And I don't want to see it from way down here. I want to go up there. I want to see it. You see what I'm saying? I want to sit down here in the cheap section. I want to get up there and see this thing, right? So I close my eyes. My, my strategy is I'm going to close my eyes the whole time. So I'm sitting in this thing, and y'all, it's swinging. It's in the air. It ain't no rail holding me. I'm just, oh, Jesus, you know what I mean? So I just got my eyes closed speaking in tongues. You know what I mean? That's, hey, that just, it's just what it is. It's a moment for tongues right here. So I'm speaking in tongues and I'm just riding. And y'all, they taking pictures. They turning around selfies. The cart in front of, because we travel, they turn around in front of us. And, ah, ah. So they just tripping. And I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's something about that name. You know what I mean? I'm, and I mess around and open my eyes. I just look. Kings and kingdoms, they all pass away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm deep in the Holy Ghost. You know what I mean? Here's the thing that I didn't see coming. You'll know, you can almost see it on the picture. Um, so on the left side, um, yeah, on the left side, you see it goes up to a steep incline and it goes all the way up. So it's dipping down and it goes all the way up. At the top up there is like this little platform. So you come up and then you got to get off on the platform immediately. <laughs> so you, you got this lift up and you feel the weight, you know, because I'm 200 pounds. <laughs> so you feel it. <laughs> And then you got to get off because there's another thing coming right behind you. So you can stand there and delay if you want to. Your head going to get knocked off. You're going to fall off this lift. You see what I'm saying? Or you can stay on and then it's going to flip you around and start bringing you back around. I wasn't prepared for any of that. So I've just got my eyes closed. Jesus. Jesus. And I get there and all of a sudden, very traumatically, there are three Chinese men standing at the thing and it's their job to get you off, out the way and get somebody else. You see what I'm saying? So all of a sudden, I just hear these men screaming in Chinese and they're just screaming at me and I'm like, ah! And they're like, move, move, get out, get out, get out. And I'm like, ah! And then I look down and it's like, whoa, this is a small platform. What is this? So I couldn't take in my terror because, whoa, there's another lift coming behind me. You know what I mean? So I jump off, and I, it's this moment of sacrifice. Either I jump off 
and get out the way or I loop back around and have to go on this thing all over again. So, or I stand there and delay and get popped in the back of the head, fall off the cliff and die at the Great Wall of China. You know what I mean? So, there are not a lot of encouraging, inspiring options for me, right? So, I jump off, I get out the way and I'm like, bro, y'all should put, give better instructions down there Where's the manager? You know what I mean? And these guys are like, come on, bro. This is, you think there's a manager here? And that's when I look up and I see one of the greatest wonders of the world, the Great Wall of China. It's breathtaking. Um, I got up there. I wasn't scared no more. After I'd taken in the wonder, to be honest, I was up there just bawling and kicking it. Watch, look at this, look at this, look at this. I'm like, hey, <laughs> Instagram, hey. I, um, as I took in the wonder of the wall, I immediately began to reflect on what it took to get there. And without taking action to get on the lift, and without making the sacrifice of jumping off the lift, I'll never get to the wonder that was at the end of the action and sacrifice. Guess what I want to talk about today? Y'all get it? Y'all get it? I, following Jesus is like getting on a ski lift. Ask Matthew, he'll tell you, he starts real low. Come and see. It's easy, all you gotta do is sit down. But if you keep walking with him, he's gonna continue to take you higher. And the requirement becomes higher. And it goes from come and see to come and die. Did, did you see that? It, go, it goes from come and see to come and die. And the sacrifice and the calling gets higher and higher and higher to a point to where ultimately you have to sacrifice and say, I'm all in. And on the other side of sacrifice is the wonder of God. Um, but in order to get there, you've got to be willing to leave the cheap seats of Christianity. Because some of us have settled to say, I want to stay in the cheap seats and I'll see the wonder from the distance. Woo, do y'all hear how I'm working this metaphor up in here today? Do y'all hear that? Lord, have mercy, this is good preaching. <laughs> but in order for you to experience the wonder, you've got to be willing to leave the cheap seats. Today, Fellowship, I want to talk to you about leaving the cheap seats of comfort so that you might experience the wonder of the kingdom. And what's in between you and the cheap seats and the wonder of the kingdom is sacrifice. Action and sacrifice. But I'm here to tell you on the other side of action, on the other side of sacrifice is the wonder of God. Everybody say the next two years. Say it again, the next two years. That, that, that's the next two weeks. I want to talk about the next two years of our church. And I am inviting you to experience the wonder of God for the next two years. But you can't get the wonder of God if you also at the same time don't accept the invitation to the action and sacrifice. Did you get that? You've, you've got to say yes to action and sacrifice because you can't get wonder Staying in the cheap seats. I'll say that again. You can't get the wonder if you stay in the cheap seats. So I guess the question is, are you ready to move out of the cheap seats? Are you ready to move out of the cheap seats? Would you just turn and ask your neighbor, Huntington Drive, turn and ask your neighbor, just turn and say, are you ready to get out of these cheap seats? You got a bad neighbor. They didn't even look up at you. Turn to somebody else. They obviously good to sit in the cheap seats. Turn to somebody else and say, I said, are you ready to get out of these cheap seats? 
I um, this this morning I want to unpack to you, and there are two questions. There are two questions that have to do with the next two years. We make a commitment to the next two years. There's two questions you want to ask. I want to ask you. What can we do in the next two years? What, what can we do if we accepted this invitation to action? What, what can we do? And secondly, what can we give if we accepted this invitation to sacrifice? Number one, what can we do? Just, just somebody say, what can we do? What, what can we do? Number two, what can we give? If for the next two years we said, God, I want to see your wonder. And for the next two years, I'm willing to take action. And I'm willing to give sacrificially so that I might experience your wonder. Amen. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Uh, for the last six, seven weeks, I've been giving you theological observation from Matthew chapter 9. I've been giving you theological observation. I've been showing you and we've been observing together the power and the wonder of God at work when, un, when compassion and hope is unleashed in the world. Uh, today, I want to move you from theological observation to now um, theological um, implication and application. Uh, theological implication and application. Uh, turn to your neighbor and tell them you've looked long enough. Try, tell somebody else, oh, you in a bad seat. I'm praying for you. Huntington Drive, I hope you better. Turn around, tell somebody else, say, you've looked long enough. Now, as a church, I want us to begin to deal with not just looking at the text, but dealing with the implications and the personal application of the text, which starts by answering the question, what can we do and what can we give? We had two years to say yes to action and sacrifice. What can we do? First thing we can do is we can multiply the movement. We can multiply the movement. We, we are part of a movement. We, we are part of a movement. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, I got so much content today, you're going to talk to your neighbor a lot. Y'all going to get real close. Uh, so I know y'all didn't know each other, although you've been married for 20 years. Today, y'all going to get to know each other a whole lot more. Amen? We're in a movement together, and we want to multiply the movement. The movement is the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, here, here's a saying we say all the time, and I, and I want you to get used to hearing it. Um, the church of Jesus Christ is God's plan A. Somebody say, it's his plan A. Here's the news. There is no plan B. There is no plan B. The church of Jesus Christ is the hope for the world. November 6th coming up, everybody talking about the election, everybody trying to figure out hope. Every campaign is promising you hope. And let me tell you something. Ain't no hope coming from the state house. Ain't no hope coming from the White House. The hope is coming from God's house. Can I, can I get a witness up in here? Can I get a witness up in here? He said, the hope is coming from me because the greatest hope for the world is the message of Jesus Christ, a Savior who died for your sins and who's coming back again to restore all things. That is the greatest hope for the world. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we are that hope. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the, a gospel-centered multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, uh, transformed by the gospel, growing in a life of worship, gathering in community, and giving our lives away on mission. That's who we are. You know, you know what I love about our church? Look, look around. Just look around. Look around. Huntington Drive, y'all look around. Look around. Look at, look at these folks up in here. We ain't supposed to be together. We ain't supposed to be worshiping together. You got Asian folks up in here, which I should get a little love. Great Wall of China. Come on. That's, come on. Multi-ethnic, come on, I'm representing, I'm representing. You got Asian folks, Latino folks, Armenian folks, white folks, black folks, folks I never heard of in Mississippi because we just didn't have that many folks, you know what I mean? We ain't supposed to be together. You got Trump supporters, you got uh, Obama, Hillary Clinton supporters, you got uh, Ross Perot supporters, you got... You got everything. Look at them. They clap. They're like, yes, Ross. Yes, the good old days. Like, you got everything in between. The last thing we're supposed to do is be worshiping together. 
Because everywhere else, the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday is the most segregated hour of the week, but not at fellowship. Not at fellowship. Because we've all opted into a movement that's greater than our own preferences and our own personal biases. We've all opted into something greater, and that is the family of God. I, I guess what I'm saying is we need to multiply that. We've got we've to look like the church of the Bible. The church of the, the Bible was not only a multi-ethnic church, but it was a multiplying church. Healthy things multiply. So what we can do in the next two years is we can multiply this church. One of the ways we do that is starting Fellowship Pasadena. Make some noise with Fellowship Pasadena. Hallelujah. <laughs> One of the great things that's going to happen in January, you're going to look up in early, 19, early 2019, Fellowship will be one church with three locations. We've got our Huntington Drive homies, which we're going to be investing in. We've got Monrovia, and we will have Pasadena. That's multiplication. <laughs> Amen? We get a chance to paint the world, to show the world the picture of Jesus' church. Say what you will, I, 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 and there's a whole lot of communication about church, but whenever you look at the Bible, the church of the Bible was clearly multi-ethnic, and it was a multiplying church. And it's important to me that our church look like our picture in the Bible. Amen? So it's important that we're a multi-ethnic, multiplying church. In the next two years, we can multiply this movement and begin to see God's church in more regions and more places and more cities. Amen? Not only am I interested in us doing that here locally, but church, we've got to do it globally. Um, because if, if the church is the greatest hope for the world here, that means it's the greatest hope for the world everywhere. A amen? We've got an amazing opportunity in India. Um, the, the culture in India is at a place now to where the prime minister... Uh, is very anti-Christianity, um, and he wants to see Christian organizations out of the country, out of the region. Um, as a matter of fact, Compassion International, uh, which we sponsor kids with, they do amazing work. They kick Compassion International out of India. Upwards of 80,000 children left without access to health care, food, education, and the spiritual formation that was happening through Compassion International. So that sent a message out to the world to say they're serious about not having Christians in the region. Well, whenever the ch church is persecuted, that is when she's at her best. So we've got a partnership in northern India, which is one of the most unchurched. You got more people that haven't heard about Jesus in that region than anywhere else in the world. It's one of the most uh, un, unreached people groups in the world. These people have never heard the name Jesus. And if they're trying to pull Christians out, that means we need to be putting Christians in. We've got an organization that's all about disciple making. Uh, they are committed to planting churches. Hey, and we're a church plant and we're committed to planting churches because in the next two years, we want to do what to the movement? Oh, I wish I had a witness, Huntington Drive. Come on. In the next two years, we want to do what to the movement? And so we, since we're in the multiplying churches, we said, yo, let's plant churches with y'all in the next two years. Do you know what we can do in India? We can plant 20 churches in India. We want to plant 20 churches in India. Now, what they have, yeah, let's, let's praise God for that. Watch this. I'm going to be like Steve Jobs up in this place today. But wait, one more thing. They have these discipleship-making houses where I've gone. They, they, they look... They, look, they appear to be schools to the, to, to the region and to the government, but internally they are these disciple-making uh, houses where these, these men and women are in there in bunks. I've seen them. I've been in there. And they study God's Word from 8 to 6, not 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. They are in class understanding and getting uh, their, 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 their degrees as pastors and be ordained as pastors. And at the end of their class, they're sent out then to go to these regions. They've got graduates waiting now so that when we fund their churches, 
they will go out to regions. Here's the deal. The 20 pastors that we will fund and they will go out to regions where people haven't heard the gospel, they are required not just to plant one church, but over the next three to five years, plant three additional churches. So they'll each have to plant four churches. So for the one church that we do, there are four other churches. So if we plant 20 churches, those churches of the next three to five years will multiply and they'll become 80 churches. That's what God's going to do. And that's what we can do in the next two years. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on, let me get a bigger one than that. Amen? Amen? What we can do in the next two years is we can multiply the movement by coming alongside churches and making sure that there's churches for every child in the, in, in the community. The second thing we can do is we can imp- oppose injustice. Uh, somebody say, fight the power. Uh, come on, I know that's some of y'all's first time ever saying those words. I, I felt good to my soul. I just like the way that sounds. Let me just say it one more time. Say, fight the power. Fight the power. There, there are systems of injustice that we as the Church of Jesus Christ, we just can't sit in the comfortable seats of the church. We've got to stand in the called places of the kingdom. And Jesus calls us to fight not just people of injustice, but systems of injustice. One of the ways that we oppose the a system of injustice, and here's something that we can do in the next two years. We've, we've been engaging in the prison system, uh, in the prison system. And there's something, as you begin to study this, some of you are way more familiar with this than I am. As a matter of fact, you can teach me about it. But as I've learned, there's, there's something called um, the pipeline to prisons. It's a pipeline of prisons. What, what it is is they, they've looked at research, they've looked at, at the implications, they've studied it, and they can tell you from a young age who's going to prison. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable. There's a pipeline. They can look at you as a 10-year-old and say, yep, you're probably going. you probably not. Because they're indicators. They're indicators. As a matter of fact, for a while, I'm not sure if they still do this, but for a while, as they were expanding prisons, they would set the amount of prison beds that they would need to build based off of the literacy of fifth graders. True stat. Can y'all believe that? Let, let me just give you a 30-second just glimpse into the prison pipeline. Here are the things that, that, that raise your chances. Like if you want a good chance of going to prison, t- turn to your neighbor and ask him if you really want to go. Trying to ask somebody, so if you really want to go, here's the three best ways to get there. Pipeline to prison. Okay, I, 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 it, it's, it's staggering to me. Number one, drop out of school. Drop out of school. Number two, don't have a home. Number three, don't have a family. You got those three? You got a good chance of ending up in prison. So in the next two years, here's what we can do. Do y'all want to know what we can do? Next two years, this is what we can do about the prison pipeline. Number one, we can keep kids from dropping out of school as we partner with Harambe. We partner with Harambe. Harambe uh, is is an amazing institution. I have the privilege of being the executive director of the organization, uh, and I'm so excited. It's a new assignment for me, which makes it a new assignment for us. Because wherever I go, we go together, boo. Uh, so we, we took on Harambe because we saw this prison of pipeline, and we said, if we can catch kids that are struggling with algebra, because I know what that's like. I'm 41. I'm still struggling with algebra. I should have shown enough been in prison. Um, because there was a time, y'all know I had to drop out. Of, y'all know I was, a, I was a high school dropout. I got my G, I had to get my GED, and there was a time when I looked and I had very few options. Sometimes I wonder if I was just one good tutor and mentor away from my high school diploma. Did y'all hear that? We want to provide tutors and mentors that can look at these young people and say, you can't give up. You can't quit. I don't care how hard it is. We're going to walk with you every step of the way. We're going to start getting you college ready in the fourth grade. 
you're going to be you're going to be wearing college sweatshirts to your third grade class. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Because we want to give you a vision beyond what you see around you. That's where the cycle can be broken. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how we impose the justice. And we can do that. We can get 100 tutors and mentors in, the, in communities where kids are struggling in the next two years. We can do that in the next two years. Turn around, tell your neighbor, we can do that in the next two years. Not only that, um, but another, and this is a big one. This, um, this is going to be one of the hardest things we've ever done. It's going to be one of the biggest things we've ever done. The foster care system. And kids with no families, look around the room. Huntington Drive, look around the room. At Fellowship, we got upwards of four-something thousand people. You know what that means? We got a lot of families. And if kids have a high chance of going to prison because they don't have a family, and we are Jesus' people, who are supposed to be looking to say what I see in you, I think we can get 100 kids out of foster care in the next two years and bring them into our families. Oh, I need y'all to clap a little bit louder than that. Come on, Huntington Drive. I think we can get 100 kids. I think through the resources, through the programs that are available, the next two years, 100 kids that look around and don't have loving families right now, two years from now, they can have loving families. Amen? Amen. We can do that as a church for the next two years. To be honest, you want to, y'all, y'all, do y'all see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm talking about how we get to the wonder. You'll never get to the wonder sitting in them cheap seats just come and watching me on Sunday. It's great. I'm cute. I know you enjoy it. But there's so much more than this. There's so much more than this. But the wonder's on the other side of sacrifice. The wonder's on the other side of action. And for the next two years, as your church and as your leadership, I I hope you see what we're doing. We're setting you up. We're setting you up. We're going to give you opportunities to take action. And we're going to be calling you week after week out of the cheap seats. This is a preview of of an upcoming attraction. Get ready. You're going to have somebody come live in your house. You're going to take somebody in in Jesus' name. Did y'all hear that? I'm prophesying over you. Do you hear that? If you Presbyterian, this is unfamiliar to you, but I'm going to just tell you, I'm prophesying. I'm telling you what's to come in your family, and it's going to change your life. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, but it's going to be the most powerful thing you've ever done because as soon as you take that child in your house, Jesus is going to say, welcome to the wonder. Are, are y'all in here with me? Woo! I don't have a lot of time. Got to hurry up. Moved. If y'all can't tell yet, I'm spelling moved. Can, have y'all figured that out yet? Multiply the movement, oppose injustice, V, value kids. Value kids. One of the things we've done here ever since our church started um, is we've always put a big value on kids and investing in our kids. As a matter of fact, we do a big offering every year to send our kids to camp. Camp is very expensive, somewhere upwards of two to four hundred dollars. Search for summer camp. Summer camp is like four, five hundred dollars for a whole week. If you got multiple kids, if you got half a kid, I mean, like that's expensive. <laughs> Folks ain't got that kind of discretionary money just laying around. So as a church, what we do is we raise a big offering so we can say to moms and dads. If finances are a problem, that's not going to disqualify your child from experiencing this spiritually transformative event. So we have scholarships available. Last year, here's a picture of the kids that went to camp. These kids went to camp. One of the ways that we want to value kids, though, is you can't really tell in that picture who's who, but um, we went to the Union Rescue Mission. Um, and that's where folks without homes go to live and stay temporarily. They get on their feet. We toured that place as a staff, and we realized something that we never really paid attention to before. At least I didn't. There were junior hires running around. There were high schoolers running around. And when you think about homelessness, you don't think about junior hires. You just don't. It just doesn't come to mind they were there. And we said, Who, what are they doing with these kids? So we said, we want to take them to camp. So if you look at that camp picture again, 
those kids from Union Rescue Mission are in that camp picture. We all went. We didn't have a separate camp just for the, for the homeless kids. Let's do a homeless kid. No, they went with our kids. They all went up to Yosemite, and they had a transformative time. Here's what we didn't see coming. At the end of that amazing week, the counselor who had the job of dropping the kids back off at the mission, he didn't see the pain coming, the burden. It was the heartbreak of leaving this amazing time, taking these kids back to this place downtown. The kids also didn't see it coming. They weren't upset because they had to go back to the place. They knew where they were going back to, but they looked at all their friends going back to Monrovia, going back to Pasadena, and thinking, y'all going to go back to y'all youth group, and we'll never see you again because nobody comes and visits their friends in the homeless shelter. It's a burden that we weren't ready for and really didn't know how to deal with it, and we really just kind of was what it was, and then... We looked up, uninitiated by us, the kids from our youth group, loaded together, worked out transportation, and went down to LA to visit their friends there in the mission. (laughs) Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We found out on Snapchat. We didn't even know. We look on there, everybody got, got, got monkey ears on, on, the, on the thing. We was like, what happened? That showed us that somehow, some way, in the next two years, we've got to find a way to consistently minister to junior hires and high schoolers who don't have a home. We've got to take our ministry and somehow make it mobilize so that we could go down. As a matter of fact, we've already started practicing. We went down to Union Rescue Mission uh, and a team of our youth leaders went down and they held youth group on the rooftop downtown LA. In the next two years, I believe we can make a difference and make an impact with junior hires and high schoolers, not just in our own neighborhood, but also those who don't have a home. Amen? Amen. 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 Value kids expand our ministry. In the next two two years, I think we can expand. As a matter of fact, take both your arms and just push the person on the side of you and just make room. Just tell them we got to make room. Tell them we got to make room. We got to make room. Huntington Drive, come on. Don't stick. Come on, push them, push them. We got to expand. Here's the idea. As we continue to take new ground and then stop pushing, some of you are just such overachievers. Relax. Stop. (laughs) You are doing the most right now. Stop. No. Um, one of, the, one of the things that we get excited about is as we take new ground in these other areas, that's continuing to take ground with what we do best, and that's inviting people into the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. So as we think about baptisms over the next two years, this is also another big goal for us, y'all. This is a big goal. I believe that we can baptize 500 new souls in the gospel in the next two years. Oh, I wish y'all could shout better than that. I believe we can do it. I believe we can do it. I believe we can do it. Just imagine what would happen if you started inviting your lost friends to church. You started inviting your lost coworkers. If you started sharing the good news of the gospel, I don't have to do 500. If each of us just got one person and said, we want to lead one person to Christ in the next two years, we double 500. As a matter of fact, we might need to change the slide. I don't know. What would happen if we just all committed to sharing the gospel with one person and leading somebody to Christ? We could easily hit that goal. D, declare the gospel. Not only expand the gospel, but one of the many things we can do is declare the gospel. What I realize is the voice of the gospel goes far well beyond what we see and hear on Sunday morning. Here's an example. A couple of months ago, a while back, I got a tweet on Twitter um, uh, this, this lady, she sent me a picture and there were a group of kids in Africa sitting there in the bush in Africa, sitting on the dirt, sitting around a chair with a laptop on it and they were watching fellowship on the laptop in the bush in Africa. Y'all don't believe me, do you? Look, watch this. 
Isn't that something? It's amazing. Y'all probably can't see it because it's a little dark, but the little boy in the front looked like he eating a piece of chicken. His eyes are open. He like, this guy's great. This brother can preach, man. Good Lord Jesus. Look at this. You know what I mean? The tweet said, she said, never underestimate the reach of what God is doing there at Fellowship Church. Amen? And here's what, she's, here's what that's told me. It taught me, I don't have time or the resources to go and teach 14 kids in the bush in Africa. But turns out, last year I did. <laughs> I did. What that means is we want to intentionally begin to focus on equipping missionaries and folks that are out there on the front lines with the gospel, recognizing that resources can go to pay people in places that have never seen, never heard, or experienced the gospel. What does it mean for us to expand our reach in declaring the gospel and creating resources to send out to the most unreached people groups? I think in the next two years, we can do that. So ju just by way of recap, what can we do in the next two years? Look at this. We can do this in the next two years by God's grace. Amen. Do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe we can do it? We can do it by God's grace. Finally, as I round third and head for home, the final question is, what can we give? What can we give? Um, you don't get to the wonder without the sacrifice. Um, 1922 in Minneapolis, the world would uh, receive one of our modern day geniuses. Um, young, young boy named Charles would find a fascination with, um, with art and cartoons and drawing. Uh, well, Charles would, would develop um, a comic strip called Peanuts, uh, who we commonly know as Charles Schultz. If you ever watch the comic strip, see the comic strip of, of the Peanuts, you'll see there's a, a plethora of interesting characters. You've got Charlie Brown, you've got Snoopy, you've got Peppermint Patty. Uh, my, what, two of my favorites are Linus and Lucy. That Lucy was something else, wasn't she? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lucy needed Jesus, didn't she? <laughs> Oh, she needed Jesus. Linus sitting there. I'm a, I have two older sisters, and I'm a baby boy, so I know what it's like to get picked on by older sisters. Um, uh, Linus is just sitting there, and I just remember this as a child. He just sitting there. He got the remote. He just enjoying himself. Lucy with herself going to come over and just snatch the remote and out of his hand. And Linus says, what gives you the right to come and just snap. What in the world makes you think you can just come and just snatch the remote out of my hand? She says, you know what gives me the right? This, one, two, three, four, five. Separate, independent of one another. They seem meaningless and without force. But when they come together, <laughs> they create a formidable foe that gives me the right to do whatever I want to do. Linus, seeing it, drops his head, walks away, looks at his hand, and says, now why can't y'all come together like that? <laughs> As we talk about sacrificial giving, our independent gifts may seem meaningless and insignificant. But I'm telling you, Fellowship family, if we all come together with our finances and our resources, we become a formidable foe that will fight against the darkness that will bring forth the light and the hope of compassion in the world. Amen? So I'm like Linus standing to a congregation and saying, we need to come together like that. Can I just tell you what we've already done? Can I just tell you how generous you already are? We're a church plant. When we started, we started with nothing. We started from scratch. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. She'll tell you, we ain't have nothing. Um, no, 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 I, I, well, nothing. Um, over the last six years, in January, we'll celebrate our seventh year anniversary. Over the last six years, we've built our budget 
to six million dollars. Six million dollars. Oh, you all praise God for that. Six million dollars. We, we've grown. That's, that, so we've been a generous church. We are generous people. As a matter of fact, can I just give you a financial, just a glimpse of where we are and where, where we're headed if we don't do anything different? This is, this is what it looks like. Here's, here's our projection. Uh, we projected hit six million this year. If we just continue to grow like we've been growing the last six, seven years, 2019, we'll do 6.2. 2020, we'll do 6.7. So you put that together, the next two years, what we can give, if we don't do nothing different, the next two years, we can give $13 million. We can do $13 million. The next two years, if we don't do no sacrifice, that's what we can do. But turn to your neighbor and tell them, we got to do more than that. I'll turn to somebody that's going to get excited. They acting funny, acting all weird, like they had prune juice for breakfast. Turn to somebody else and say, child, we got to do better than that. <laughs> like I said to many of you last week, if you were here, or the half of you that were here, some of y'all only come once in, once in a quarter a month, I know. But, but what we want to ask so that we can do what we just talked about in the next two years we want to ask above and beyond our normal giving for us to give an additional $5 million over the next two years. T turn to somebody and say, yeah, we can do that. Oh, uh, y'all getting real soft and quiet now. So look, so, so what we normally give is $13 million. What we're asking is that we will come together and give above and beyond that $5 million which then total in two years, what can we give in two years? Here's the total. Look at y'all, some of y'all passed that class and uh, I didn't pass it, I needed help, I needed a whole slide. I couldn't do this math on my own. Now, before you pass out, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. We gathered about 120 or so families from fellowship this past week and we ask them to say, pray with their families and ask the question, what can you give above and beyond? And they made pledges, including our team. And we've already got committed to this from those just 120 something families, $3.5 million. $3.5 million. So now all we ask is that you would join us on the journey. Would you get with your family? and pray and say above our regular giving, what we normally would give in two years, what we normally would do, what above and beyond that could we do so that we can multiply the movement, oppose injustice, value our kids, expand our ministries, and declare the gospel. And I'm only asking what your family can do, not compared to anybody else. God knows the level of sacrifice. What's gonna happen is in a couple of weeks, uh, November 18th, November 18th, we're going to have a, what we call the Commitment Sunday, where every family of fellowship, we're going to answer the question of what we can give as a family. And when we all commit our pledge for two years, I'm convinced that God is going to more than provide all that we need. Because in two years, if we take on the action, if we make, make the sacrifice, church, as a church family, we can experience the wonder of God together. Amen? Commitment Sunday will look something like this. We'll have a commitment. You know what? We got a video. Just watch the video. I, you can just watch it. I mean, sit here talking all the time. Let's watch the video. Y'all can just see it. Shoot, save my voice. I got two more services. Making your commitment. Once you've decided to participate in MOVED, making a financial commitment is easy. Just follow these simple steps. Step one, enter the total amount you are committed to giving from now through November 2020. Remember, MOVED is a one fund campaign. That means your commitment and giving over the next two years will not only provide the resources to fund our MOVED initiatives, but will also fund our ongoing ministries. If you are currently giving $100 a week, that means you're giving $5,200 a year. So your commitment over two years would already be $10,400. Ask. What can I sacrifice above that amount over the next two years to help fuel our MOVE initiatives? If you can sacrifice an additional $50 a week, that increases your total giving from $5,200 a year to $7,800 a year, 
and increases your total giving over two years from $10,400 to $15,600. If you're still unsure about how much you can give, refer to the potential giving chart in the Move magazine or on the commitment card to help guide you. You'll be amazed by how much you can give when it's spread out over time. Once you've prayed about how much you can give, enter that amount in the first box. Step two, as a part of your overall commitment, enter the amount you can give this month as a First Fruits lead gift. Your First Fruits lead gift will allow us to begin fueling some of our moved initiatives like Planting Fellowship Pasadena in January and much needed churches in India. Once you've prayed about how much you can give as a First Fruits lead gift, enter that amount in the second box. Step three, check off the appropriate boxes at the bottom of the card to inquire about setting up recurring giving or to learn more about how you can make unique gifts such as stock dividends, property donations, company matching, and more. Our business department will follow up with you shortly. The way moved happens is when we all get involved and participate. Don't miss out on the blessing of seeing God move as we unleash compassion and hope throughout the world. Jesus was moved with compassion, and as we follow his example, we're anticipating an abundance of life transformation and community impact. What can we do in two years? I believe we can unleash a lot of compassion, a lot of hope. What can we give in two years? Together, if we individually answer that question as families, I believe that we can give well over $18 million to see that action take place. The sacrifice allows us to take the action, which then brings us into the wonder. The big goal is not for everybody to give big numbers, although if you had two years, you'd be amazed at what you could give over the period of two years, that's a long time. That's 365 days plus another 365 days, which is, which is a lot of days. I told you, I didn't have them tutors and mentors. I need them. Um, so would you pray with your family? Let get together as a family. Include your children in the process. Is that God called us to do something big. What can we do sacrificially over the next two years so that we might experience the wonder of God in a way unlike ever before? Commitment Sunday will come and we'll walk through that pledge together as a church family. Listen, don't miss November 18th. It is going to be one of the most historic days in our church's history. Rose and I, we um, started this journey about 13 years ago when we moved from Mississippi. We got on the ski lift about four o'clock in the morning, my mom dropped us off at the Jackson International Airport in Mississippi. I don't know why International is in there. We had to fly to Atlanta before we could even go anywhere. Um, we were scared. Didn't have any family out here. Only had two friends. We got on the ski lift. And we said, God, we trust you left my church of 14 people. I was working at a pawn shop wearing khakis and a red polo. That's why you'll never see me in khakis or a red polo. <laughs> Seven years ago, after we seen God provision, and as he had taken us higher and higher, seven years ago, he says, all right, it's time to leap. It's time to jump. I want you to start a church Start a church. Jesus, my last church had 14 people. Shut up. Start a church. My wife was like, we don't have benefits, retirement, life insurance, or salary. Shut up. Start a church. Our Jesus is an Old Testament Jesus. He speaks to us pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty violently. <laughs> he, he, he uses expletives and everything. He's like, shut up. He's like, okay, G Old Testament Jesus, okay. We took a leap. We took action, used our own money, and made sacrifice. And I'm here to tell you, 
on the other side of that sacrifice, on the other side of that action, we experience the wonder. You think the Great Wall of China is something? It pales in comparison to the wonder of Fellowship Church. So on the other side of our sacrifice and action, we get to see this wonder. I can't help but wonder what God has next for us as we take another leap of action. Did y'all see what I did there? I can't help but wonder about the wonder. Amen? Sacrifice, action, experience the wonder for his glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.